Today, our workshop is on planning versus preparing for medical school, and our presenter is Ronald Bresnak. So let's please give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dr. Ron Bresnak, and I'm Assistant Dean for Academic Affairs at the Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine. And my talk today is on planning versus preparing for medical school. And believe it or not, there's a tremendous difference between planning and preparing for medical school. All pre-medical students plan for medical school, but only those who prepare get accepted. There's a big difference. Let's start talking a little bit about the definition of the word planning and preparing. Uh, initially, the, the, the first part of this uh, presentation will be a little bit boring, but it'll get sexy as it, as it continues. <laughs> Definition of the word planning. <clears throat> planning is developing or a proposed or tentative project or course of action. It's creating a basic procedure towards achieving an objective. And your objective is to get into medical school. <clears throat> Simply put, it's, it's an intended set of actions towards a goal. Again, your goal is to get into medical school, both your objective and your goal. Planning is the first step towards attaining that goal, and preparing is the second step. <clears throat> Let's look at a definition of the word preparing. <clears throat> preparing is putting together or making a combination of various elements or ingredients. It's making ready in advance for a particular purpose or for some use or event. Now this use or event, again, is trying to get into medical school. That is your goal. In other words, for preparing what you're going to do, you're going to assess your plan, and if needed, modify it. <laughs> Planning is, is putting together organized set of actions towards a goal and using this plan to, uh, to complete your goal. It's a higher level of personal involvement, much higher level. Let me give you some examples. For definition of the word planning, I am planning on completing my graduate education in four years. I think when we all started college, that was a great plan. Sometimes we were successful, sometimes we weren't. Preparing is a little different. It's more higher level of, of action on your part. I will strategically put together a plan with contingency options which can be analyzed and modified if needed. How many people here uh, took every, got every course that you wanted in college? Nobody, nobody, nobody. Because sometimes the classes are filled or sometimes there's a conflict with the schedule. And that's what you're talking about. That's what we're talking about here today. You're gonna be making some changes and you're gonna have to analyze the situation. Let's look at a typical undergraduate uh, schedule. First semester, first year, you're going to take Bio 101 with a lab. Second semester, first year, Bio 2 with a lab. Second year, first semester, Inorganic 101 with a lab, and then followed up by Inorganic 2 with a lab. Then the third year, Organic with a lab, and maybe some sort of a sexy bio course. Mm -hmm. Then the third semester, uh, so third year, second semester, you're going to take Organic 102, again, with another bio course. And then finally, in your fourth year, you're going to fill, finish up for, with your physics courses and maybe another couple bio courses. This is your plan. This is the plan even before you started college. And um, unfortunately, it doesn't always happen that way. So preparing. What, if, what happens if the, if the Bio 102 course is filled in the first semester, first, uh, second semester of the first year? What do you do? Well, a couple of things that you can do. Again, it's the Bio 102 course, second semester, first year. What are you going to do? Well, you're going to make some changes. After you analyze the situation, you're going to make some changes. One of the possibilities, you can take the course in the summertime. Another one is take Inorganic 101 instead. And then you take your, your basic Bio in the second year. You're going to do something because you want to keep in tune with your original plan of your courses. Even though they're going to be modified a little bit, you want to stay in tune with that plan. Let's look at another plan. 
I'm planning on maintaining a 3.5 science GPA throughout my undergraduate career. If you want to get into medical school, you got to shoot for a 3.5, and I think this is a great opportunity to, to look at what we're doing here and maybe modify some of your plans for, for the situation that you might be in. For instance, in preparing, I received a C in Bio 101 and a B minus in Bio 102. So your first Bio course, you got a C. Your second Bio course, you got a B minus. So what do I need to do to get into my, in my inorganic 101 course to bring my science GPA up to at least the B average? What do I need to do? Can I do this? And the answer is no. You cannot bring your science GPA up to a B average with only an A in inorganic chemistry. You also need an A in uh, inorganic chemistry one and inorganic chemistry two. You need both. You need to, to work on this. If you have problems with one course, you have to work extra hard to get, to get A's in the other course. Again, this is the, the Bio 101 course. In the Bio 101 course, and every course that you're taking in science, you gotta learn, learn what you need to do to prepare for medical school, or pharmacy school, or dental school. This plays for all of them, okay? So let's, stay, let's look at the Bio 101 course. Things in the Bio 101 course are typically something like biology of the cells, the basic structures and functions of the cell, cellular respiration, Krebs cycle, origins and evolution of life. These are things in the, in the very, very first bio course you're gonna probably be taking. And what you're gonna do, you're gonna pick out the main parts of those bio, of, those bio, of the bio course for, for you to prepare for medical school. So what you're going to do is start creating a review book with, with scientific information that's gonna help you prepare for medical school. Every single science course, you're going to create a review book. And when it comes time to start studying for MCATs, you're not going to go back to these big, gigantic textbooks. You're going to study from your review books. Because you think the re this stuff, the information you're putting in your review books is the most important thing. So if you're going to text back to the textbook, you're going to, you're going to study that anyway. So make sure your review books are very, very complete. That's for preparing. Planning. I'm planning on taking the MCAT in the summer between my third and fourth year. A great plan. I have a better idea. I will create a review book for studying for the MCAT, the information necessary for medical school, which I've learned in my Bio 101 and Bio 102 courses. You're starting to develop a, a procedure for you to be successful in medical school. So the second part of your preparing is I will review bio in depth, these two courses in depth, the summer between my first and second year of undergraduate from my created review book. So you've taken your bio 101 course, you, you have a review book. You've taken your bio 102 course, you have a review, review book. Now the summer between your first and second year, you want to study as much as you can from your review books. Now, in the second, second year, you're going to be doing inorganic, you're going to do inorganic chemistry. Again, you're going to create a review book. And then at the end of the second semester, you take inorganic chemistry too. You create a, a review, review book. Then the summer between your second and your third year, what you do is you, you study from your review books, from both your inorganic chemistry plus your biology. You have to remember that you're going to be learning this much stuff you're going to probably be forget, forgetting some of it, so you're going to actually know this stuff. So if you keep reviewing and reviewing and reviewing, you're going to come back up to the part that you actually started to learn. <clears throat> Planning. I will apply to five allopathic MD programs and five osteopathic programs, DO programs. That's a very, very general statement. Now what you need to do, you need to do some research. You need to look at all these schools that you think you're going to be applying to and do some research. Look at their curriculum. Curriculum is probably the most important thing that you need to look at. If, if their curriculum is not the way you learn, move on. Go on to a different medical school. Apply to a different medical school because you're probably not going to be a happy camper. If you study one way, you learn one way, and they're teaching you a totally different way. 
I have a better idea. And I'm going to use our school for an example. I'll be applying to LEADCOM, an osteopathic medical school, because they have five different curriculum pathways. Five different pathways. A, a typical medical school has one, possibly two pathways. LEADCOM has five. Which means if you need your hand held and you need someone to tell you to read pages 39 to 54, you ought to consider going into a lecture discussion pathway. That's a pathway where you have PowerPoint presentations by faculty. That's a pathway where you really, really get to know the faculty. The problem is you're in, you're in big lecture courses. And so you really have to learn to follow the notes pr provided by the faculty in a lecture discussion. But they're going to hold your hand throughout the, the, uh, the program. Second pathway, independent study. If you are an independent kind of learner, independent study pathway would probably be the best for you. That's where you learn one-on-one -on -one or one or two with a doc, and you still have a chance to sit in some of the lectures from the lecture discussion pathway, but for the most part, you're doing learning as an independent student. Third pathway, problem-based learning. If you like to study with small groups, if you like to study clinical cases, and if you don't want to take courses in, in for instance, biochemistry, in, in the, in the problem-based learning pathway, there's no, there's no problem, there's no uh, bio, biochemistry courses. There's no pathology courses. There's no pharmacology courses, microbiology courses, immunology. You learn everything by means of cases. In a traditional program, you might have anatomy for 25 weeks, followed by uh, physiology, followed by biochemistry. Then in the second year, you have a course in pharmacology, followed by pathology, microbiology, immunology, molecular biology, and genetics. And quite honestly, there's, like, there's a problem connecting the dots. With problem-based learning, you're totally immersed in the case. So you're going to look at the anatomy of the case, the histology of the case, physiology of the case, biochemistry of the case, and then you're going to come up with a treatment plan, look at the pharmacology of the case. It's totally, it's totally interrelated. The fourth pathway that they have, if you're interested in being a primary care physician, LECOM has a primary care scholars pathway where you graduate medical school in three years rather than four. You save one year tuition and you graduate one year early. What happens when you go graduate from, uh, from the three-year program, you automatically go into one of our, our residency programs in family medicine, internal medicine, ob -GYN, or pediatrics. Now, does this mean that you cannot be a cardiologist coming down the road? No. Because in order to go into cardiology, you have to do three years of internal medicine anyway. Same thing with a GI doc, infectious disease. A lot of these fellowships, you have to do three years of internal medicine anyway. So this would be a great opportunity to save a year, save a year tuition. And a lot of people are shaking their head. That's a great, great program. And finally, the last program that we have, if you are a physician assistant, you automatically get into medical school, and what will happen, you will then graduate in three years. It's another three-year program. So think about the curriculum, because that's very, very important. I've seen a lot of people who have one mode of learning, and they get into a medical school, and it's a totally different mode of, mode of teaching, and they have problems. So that's one of the most important things you need to look at. Again, we go to LEADCOM simply because of the tuition. The tuition is the second least expensive of any private school in the country. Now, what does this mean with, with, with tuition? Well, if you go to, if you graduate from a school that's, uh, uh, say, $30,000 a year, which is the LEADCOM average, at the end of, and you start paying back your loans over a 10-year period of time, you're going to be paying back approximately $1,280 a month for 10 years. That's an awful lot of money, $1,280 a month for 10 years. But if you graduate from a school that the average tuition is $48,400, you'll be paying back over $3,000 a month for 10 years. That's almost $1,800 a month different for 10 years. I mean, $1,800, that's a mortgage payment, that's an alimony payment, it's some sort of a payment that you're going to be paying back. <laughs> 
And if you graduate from a school that the tuition is over $60,000, you'll be paying back about $3,500 a month for 10 years. And you know what? If you do good in a tuition-based school that's lower, you're going to get into the same residency programs. You have to realize DOs go into DO residency programs. DOs also go into MD residency programs. So it should have no effect in your future coming down the road. LECOM also has amongst the highest pass rates in the to total mean scores in the United States. Three out of four years, the Bradenton campus, which is in Florida, had 100% pass rate on the boards. Had, had the mean scores were amongst the highest in the nation. The Seton Hill campus in Greensburg, Pennsylvania, last year had 100% pass rate on the boards. So it's just not one campus. All three campuses of, of LECOM do very, very well on the boards. You have to realize getting into a residency program is very, very challenging. The competition is very, very stiff. Last year, according to the information, there was about 40,000 people applied for residency programs. There's only 30-some thousand spots. Many people did not get in. They graduated from medical school. They were in debt $200,000 and did not get into a residency program. So what do you do? Well, without going through a residency, you might be called doctor, but you're never going to get a license, and you can never practice medicine. So my thoughts are, do not jump up and down that you got accepted into a medical school. Jump up and down that you got accepted into a good medical school. Because that could be the difference between you getting into a residency or not. <coughs> Finally, <coughs> The graduates of the, of the program are very important. When you talk to, to these various medical schools, ask them, where do your, your graduates go for residency? If they tell you they go to Bob's Hospital for Family Medicine and you've never heard of Bob's Hospital, you might want to think, think about that. For the simple reason, they're trying to market their best, the best results. And if Bob's Hospital for Family Medicine is their best results, that could be problematic. There's a lot of great family medicine residency programs out there. Bob's Hospital may not be the best one. Okay, planning. Let's get back to planning. I will shadow a physician while in college. Preparing. I will shadow a family physician, Dr. Smith, in my sophomore year, and a pediatrician, Dr. Jones, in my junior year. It's more, it's more planned, it's more thought out. Because you're going to identify a person uh, that you're going to be meeting with in part of your plan. And then finally, I will do volunteer work in Tom's, Tom's Hospital during the summer between my first and second year. Your plan is much more complete. Because you're looking at the first year, you're looking at the second year, you're looking at the third year, and this is what you want to do. You just can't do, decide to go into medical school at the last minute. It's probably not going to happen. It's going to be very, very difficult to get in. If you decide in your junior or senior year, I want to be a doc. It's going to be very, very difficult. Planning. I will write my personal statement in the spring of my third year. Preparing. My personal statement will be written throughout my third year and will include the following. I will start with a quote about my personal philosophy. 100 years from now, it will not matter what my bank account was, how big my house was, or what kind of a car I drove, but the world might be a little bit better because I was important in the life of a child. That's a very, very powerful first statement of, of your person, first sentence of your personal statement. Very, very powerful. If I'm reading that as a person on the missions committee, I want to read more. I want to read more about it. My personal statement will include the following. Children of all ages have always fascinated me. They possess an honesty and a zest for life that adults have somewhat lost along the way. However, along the way, I've noticed something. I'm always drawn to children who are sick. My first real experience was in children's health care in, my, in high school when I was a volunteer at my local children's hospital. Laughing, being shy, screaming, coughing, sniffling, 
angry children. I loved every minute of it. That tells me something when I read that. That tells me I want to get involved with my patients. And my patients are going to be children. That's who I want to get involved in. Preparing. My personal statement will also include the following. I am confident that I have the necessary attributes, motivation, and work hard ethics to become a pediatrician. My passion for knowledge and education goes hand in hand with being a pediatrician, which is a unique blend of a healthcare provider and educator. What that tells me, I'm interested in preventive medicine. I want to educate my patients. I not only want to treat them, I want to prepare them for the future. I want to educate them so that I don't see them that often, simply because they're not sick. Preparing. My personal statement will also include the following. The importance of family is another reason I am so drawn to medicine. I come from a very large, close-knit family. Having that support system has a tremendous impact on my life and shaped me into the person I am today. What that tells me, I'm, that this person is a team player. She works well with her family, and I'm sure she will work, he or she will work well with someone else. Team players are very, very important. You have to realize there are no all-stars in medicine anymore, only team players. You can be the best surgeon on the planet, but if you don't have someone there helping you putting the patient to sleep, if you don't have a circulating nurse or a scrub nurse, you can't do it by yourself. Who cleans the operating room? Who makes sure it's sterile? You're all part of a team. And this shows me just in that one little one part of the statement that I'm a team player. That's what that tells me. Finally, my goal is to attend Bob's Medical School because the place is quality as one of the highest priorities and is committed to excellence. What that tells me, I read information about this school. I know what this school is all about. I know there's quality there because I found out because I talked to people that went there. I found out because I found out where they went to residencies. I found out about their board scores. That tells me I've done some research about that school because they have high priority and a commitment to, committed, to, uh, committed to excellence. Planning. I am planning on going to Bob's Medical School for an interview, which I have been granted. Preparing. I will, uh, I will review Bob's Medical School URL page on the internet. I will know everything I can from that internet. I will study that as hard as I possibly can for the simple reason when I get there, I want to make sure that they know I know all about the school. I will look at the academic catalog. I will, I will look at everything about it. And I also will come with questions for which I know the answers to. And when you interview there, first, and you finish your interview, what the interviewers will probably say, say to you, um, how was your visit? They'll ask you how the visit was, and that you have any final questions. And you can say yes. Can you tell me about the curriculum? I, I don't understand the curriculum. And, and what they'll tell you, they'll start tell, telling you maybe two, three, four sentences about the curriculum. Then you can jump in and finish the paragraph because you know all about this. This shows that, that either you pick up very, very quickly from a few sentences or you've done a lot of preparation to getting there. That's very, very important. Preparing. I will arrive in town the night before and get a good night's sleep. If you're going to be, if you live in California and you're going to be interviewing on the East Coast, you have to realize there's a three hour time difference. Do not, do not, do not ever think of taking the red eye there to getting there for, a, uh, for an interview first thing in the morning because your body's not going to be ready for it. We had a student that a few years ago came from, from uh, California, took the red eye in, got there on plenty of time. He, we were supposed to be there at 8, 8 o'clock. He was there about 20 to 8. He was all ready to go, but he fell asleep during the interview. <clears throat> fell asleep during the interview. Now, this person had a great application file. Tremendous. 
had great MCATs, great GPAs, went to a great school, fantastic letters of recommendation, did a lot of volunteering, did a lot of shadowing. This person could have get, got in without, without a problem. Fell asleep during the interview. And the worst part about it, he was staying over for the next two nights. What he should have done is replanned his schedule and got there the night before. He probably would have got accepted. Now, I, I saw this particular student oh, about six months later, and apparently he did this at a couple other places as well. And so I really don't even know if he ever got into medical school. You want to arrive on time. There's nothing worse than coming for an interview and coming late. Nothing worse. Because that shows that this is not a major priority to me if I get there late. So get there on time. If you get there 15, 20 minutes early, that's fantastic. Because that shows, damn it, I want to be here. That's what it shows. Be professionally dressed. About five or six years ago, we had a student who came for an interview in a Hawaiian shirt and flip-flops. <clears throat> not professionally dressed not professionally dressed. And again, bring, bring a list of questions that you already know the answers to. Very, very important. Finally, I will thank everyone at Bob's Medical School for being so nice to me during the interview. Planning, preparing. I will thank everyone at Bob's Medical School for being so nice to me during the interview, and I will send a thank you letter to my interviewers and others in the admissions department. Last year, we had three different students, and when it came to my admissions committee, we were, we were undecided. Do we want to accept this particular student or what? These, these, these three students or what? Three different, three different students. And... Um, <clears throat> So what we did, we put the, uh, the application on hold, the file on hold after the interview. And um, like I said, we were just kicking this thing around for several weeks. Do we bring this person for an interview or what? Well, what happened then, these, these three people all sent very, very nice handwritten letters. And talked to, all three of them talked about their interview, talked about the curriculum. Talked about meeting with the students. Talked about the faculty. Talked about Bradenton in general. We, br we brought the uh, file back for review for I think it's probably the third or fourth time for most of, for the, all three of these students. Then we all, it was almost unanimous, let's give this, these people a try. And we accepted all three of them. And quite honestly, all three of them did very, very well. They're up in the temp upper 10% of our class. Things to choose, to consider when choosing a medical school. Create a list of possible schools, MD or DO. My thoughts, you have to look at all schools, MD and DO schools. And pick the school that fits you. You have to realize, not only are they going to accept you, you have to accept them. You have to accept them as well. Anybody know anything about DO schools? Oh, let me tell you something. Go ahead. What do you know? Yeah. Uh, they, their osteopathic medicine, it's very similar to the MD degree. You have the pretty much the identical training. Uh, it's run by AOA rather than the AAMC, and they have their own set of residencies, um, fellowships, and all those things are available. Pretty much all the specialties are the same. Uh, they tend to profess a more holistic approach, the whole person thing. Um, they also have generally like an osteopathic, um, like OMM sort of component to things, which is more about like physical direct things you can do to help with medicine or help with conditions rather than just treating them with drugs and stuff like that. But all in all, it's fairly similar. I think she's going to take my job in the future. <laughs> she knew that. She knew that very, very well. Now I'm scared about my job. <laughs> she's exactly right. It's very, very similar to allopathic or MD medicine, but there are some differences. The osteopathic programs, osteopathic medical schools, osteopathic training, everything about oste osteopathy was started by a person doc who was an MD, Dr. A.T. Still. He was born in 1828 and he died in 1927. 
And what was happening in that, those days, there was illnesses, major illnesses throughout the, the United States and throughout the world. His wife, his three children, and his one adopted child all died of spinal, spinal meningitis. Now, here you are, a physician, and your whole family is being wiped out. What do you do? Well, what he did, he spent the next 30 years of his life. And what he was doing, he was studying the human body and coming up with different ways of diagnosing and treating diseases. And he came up with various tenets or principles of osteopathic medicine. First tenet that he came up with states that structure and function are, are, are the same. They have to work together. What he's talking about basically is the anatomy and, and, and the physiology. They both work together. Without one, you don't have the other. As, and, you know, in, in the early, early 1900s, late 1800s, this was a big, big difference. Because they didn't think about things like that. They really weren't sure what medicine was all about. They weren't really sure what disease was all about. So to come up with a statement like that, he was well, well ahead of his time. Second tenet that he comes up is, is that the body will cure itself in many cases. And he's right. You cut your finger, it'll bleed a little bit, but eventually it'll heal. If you have a fever, what happens? The body tries to, to get rid of the fever, so it makes you sweat to cool you down and bring you down to homostasis. That's the second tenet. Third tenet he talks about is that Illness in one part of the body may lead to illness in another part of the body. This is fascinating for that period of time. Fascinating. Because no one even looked at it that way. Basically what he's saying is, let's say that you have a, um, a real bad psoriasis. Well, psoriasis could possibly lead to other illnesses, such as maybe diabetes. Could also lead to heart problems. Could also lead to stroke. And basically what he was talking about is inflammation. Because it all inflammation. All because of inflammation. And to think about that in the late 1800s, early 1900s, it's just remarkable that someone be that far ahead of his time. And then finally, what he talked about, just like the young lady here talked about, treat the whole body. Now, if you treat the body with inflammation, right, with psoriasis, it's very possible, maybe diabetes, maybe the heart problems, maybe would not have, not have taken effect. So you treat the entire body. And that's what his philosophy is. And that's what the DO schools are all about. Um, another thing to consider when, when applying to a medical school is the tuition. We talked a little bit about the tuition, but that's very, very important. About four years ago, we had one of our students, he was in the third year, and he was doing a rotation up in South Carolina. And he fell in love with a medical student from another school. And he and she were on the exact same rotation. The only difference was his tuition at that time in Bradenton was 28000 She was paying 56000 for the exact same doctor, the exact same rotation. Tuition is very, very important. Is the curriculum the best for me? Again, we've talked about that two, three, four times, and as far as I'm concerned, that's the whole focus of what you need to look at for medical school, for pharmacy school, for dental school, for every school that you, you're thinking of going into is the curriculum. Is the geographic location of the school acceptable to me and my family? Geography. Is, um, is a problem at times. Let me give you an example. Um, about four years ago, I met this girl from when I was up at the University of Cal, Cal State Northridge, Cal State Northridge. And uh, I ta talked her into applying to our school in Florida. And she did. And she got accepted. And here it is, about um, halfway through the uh, application cycle, she, she withdrew. So I called her on the phone. I said, why are you withdrawing? She said, I really don't want to leave California. I said, OK, I'm sorry about this, but you had a, a good, good spot here. Well, about four or five weeks ago, I saw her at a conference. I honestly did not remember her until she came up to me. She's still trying to get into medical school. 
four years later because she doesn't want to leave California. Now, if you go to medical school, you're going to do your first two years, for instance, in Bradenton or Erie or Greensburg. You can do a lot of your rotations back in California if you really want to. She could have been graduating from medical school this year, but she put it off because she did not want to leave the state. Last year, there's approximately 6,000 people who applied to medical school in California. There's only 2,000 spots. Now, if you throw the people from other states trying to get into California, you got you maybe have 8, 10, 12, 15,000 people trying to get in for those 2,000 spots. So you really have to think about this. Am I willing to give up my career because I don't want to leave the state? It makes no difference which state you're in. You have to look for yourself. <clears throat> okay, uh, how do students do on, um, on national board exams? When you talk to these, these schools, ask them those questions. It's very, very important. How well do they do? And same thing getting into residencies like we talked a little bit about before. Finally, prepare to be successful in all of your endeavors. All of your endeavors. Anybody have any idea what kind of docs you want to be? Yes? Uh, I think that I would prefer to be in some sort of surgical field. Okay, surgical field. Anybody else? Yes, sir? Cardiology. Cardiology? I would like to be in internal medicine. Internal medicine. Well, you can be them in, in that DO or an MD school because you can go into the similar re residency programs. That's very, very important. Uh, I have four children. Well, I have. I have four children. Two of them are DOs. Now, my daughter, when she was real little, she kept saying that she wanted to be an OB-GYN doc. No idea what OB-GYN was. <laughs> the only thing she knew is she wanted to take care of mommies and deliver babies. That's what she wanted to do. Ever since she was little, through junior high, through high school, through college, through medical school, inter internship, she, she's planning her internship and her residency. She got accepted into an OB-GYN residency. She turned it down. She turned it down because she fell in love with one of her classmates. And he wanted to do family medicine. So she changed at the last minute. She changed all of her life. Since she, for 15, 16, 18 years, that's what she wanted. And she changed at the last minute. So chances are pretty good you're going to change too. My son... I remember when he was about 12 years old, he kept saying, you know, Dad, if I go to medical school, I know I'm going to have a tough time. I'm going to be studying real, real hard from, from high school through college to medical school, internship and residency. I'm not going to have a life, Dad. I'm not going to have a life. And so what I, what I want to do, when I graduate from medical school, internship and residency, I want to have an easy job. I want no stress in my life. I want to kick back and relax. I want to take care of patients three days a week and golf the other four. I want to be a dermatologist. <laughs> He's an ER doc today. He changed. On his second rotation in, in dermatology, he, he calls me on the phone. He says, you know, Dad, I can't go into dermatology. I, I said, why? What's the matter? Well, I thought that's what you wanted. He said, that's just too damn boring for me. All I'm doing is shaving skin all day long. I, by 2 o'clock, I'm falling asleep. I can't stay awake the rest of the day. I need more excitement in my life. So he went to Arrowhead Regional in Southern California, and he did his residency in emergency medicine, same place my daughter and my son-in-law did her, their residencies down there. While he was down there, he fell in love with an intern, a DO intern, who also is interested in internal medicine, I mean, in emergency medicine. Well, she, did, then she left the internship there, and she went over to UCLA and did her uh, residency at UCLA. So my son, what he did, he applied for a fellowship at UCLA. And, and he got it. And, and it's in, in, um, in, in, a, in, a, in a specialty that it's important as an ER doc. See, most ER docs are now focusing on one area, one area that, that they want to focus on, and that's where he did a fellowship. And that's, that was an opportunity that, that most people don't get. 
So, um, let me, in conclusion, let me give you what I, what I have is Brezhnev's three rules once you get to be a medical student. Okay? Brezhnev's three rules. Number one rule, don't piss off the boss. <laughs> now, who's the boss? The boss is the dean of the medical school. The boss is the faculty at the medical school. The boss is the preceptor when you're on rotations. The boss is, when you're on a rotation and there's a lab tech there, you never want to piss off a lab tech. You know why? They have so much knowledge about laboratory medicine that they could share with you. You piss him or off, hair off, you lost a teaching moment. A nurse, you know, you never want to piss off a nurse. And you know why? Because when you're on night call and you want to get some sleep, you piss off a nurse, he or she will call you every 10 minutes to let you know the patient is doing just fine. <laughs> never piss off a nurse. Number two rule, make a copy of everything. Because you're going to give it to me, I'm going to lose it. You're going to apply for your license, it's going to get lost in the mail. You apply for hospital privileges, and guess what? Your folder's floating around the hospital someplace they can't find it, and you have to start over. Additionally, when you apply for hospital privileges, they want to know what every rotation you did in medical school, in internship and residency. If you've forgotten that, that could be a problem. Make a copy of everything. Third rule, only join organizations that serve food. <laughs> you follow these three rules, you'll be a happy camper, and you get through medical school, and you have a great life in the future. Any questions? Yes, sir. So, after you're in medical school, and you're done with the first two years, and you're going on to rotation, do you get to choose where you go, or should you go? What we have at the Bradenton campus, we're affiliated with about 140 hospitals all over the United States. And what we do, we have a process set up where you work with the clinical education department to identify the rotations that you want. Chances are good you, you might get, you're probably going to get most of them, but you're not going to get all of them. Even in residency, you don't get every rotation that you want. I don't know how many res rotations my daughter had canceled when she was in residency. So we will work with you, try to identify rotations for you and with you, and we'll put together a plan for you. It should, it should not be a problem whatsoever. We don't have, have any, anybody complaining about that. Big thing is they want to get a good education. And so the affiliate hospitals that we're working with really have great academic programs. So you should not have any problems there at all. Anybody else? Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Have a nice day.